Okay, we're going to complete this proof by providing the missing reasons. They tell us that side SD is perpendicular to side HT, and I'm just going to um, just highlight that there. ST, uh, sorry, SD is perpendicular to HT. Okay, so we also know that SH is congruent to ST, that's this, is congruent to this, and then they start to talk about the um, angles into SDH, it's right here, and SDT are right angles. Um, how do we know that? Well, it wasn't, even though it's in the drawing, it's marked as right angles. Um, that's really the reason why they mark it that way is because it's given that SD is perpendicular to HT. So um, how do we actually give a reason for the fact that they're right angles? We, we would say here, let's see if I can fit this. Um, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. Let's see. Um, and what we really are dealing with here is the fact that the um, definition of perpendicularity states that it will form right angles. So I'll just write perpendicular, perpendicular. Yeah, definition of perpendicular. So now we are told that for step three, SH is congruent to ST. Well, that was something that was given to us. So we're just going to write that that was given. Given. Okay, and we see by the what by the reflexive property of congruence. Um, step four doesn't have the statement; it's just got the reason. But by the reflexive property, well, what would be reflexively congruent in this particular um, in this particular drawing or illustration or figure? Um, well, that would be SD, the side that's being shared. Sorry, I feel a little inarticulate right now. Um, but SD, that line that runs down the middle, that's a shared side for both of the triangles on the left and right, um, is reflexively congruent to itself. So we're going to write that in there. <laughs>